to go live on. So we're live uh, on YouTube. <clears throat> Uh, welcome anyone who's joining us out in the world. This is the fourth copyright conversation. We'll have a fifth one in the fall with some of our publisher friends, but today is Intellectual Property Lawyer Day. Um, I sent out, I sent an email to the editor of the Hymn, Robin Knowles Wallace, who's an amazing editor, and she's she's been in the the publishing the journal publishing game for a long time for the Hymn Society. And one of her colleagues is Kevin Smith, who you'll see on the screen here. So I, I contacted Robin, and she said, you should, you should contact Kevin Smith. He's, he's passionate about this, really knowledgeable. And I said, okay. And then he sent out an email, and I just got tons of folks who are both passionate and knowledgeable about intellectual property uh, law and church music or and, and can speak to where what we're talking about which is congregational song and copyright so um i'm gonna let each one of them introduce themselves and then we'll just dig into some questions so uh, kevin why don't we start with you since you're the one that kind of connected us all and then you can pass the baton great thank you brian um and yeah robin Knowles wallace is wonderful and um, she and i actually started the same day working at the Methodist Theological School in Ohio, where I was an assistant librarian and she was the professor of uh, worship and music until her retirement just very recently. So uh, I, I was delighted to have that connection with Robin. And actually uh, I went to law school while I was working at Methesco because of my interest in copyright issues. So I've never actually been a practicing lawyer. I always try to make that clear. I'm a lawyer who is has became one in order to be a better librarian. Um, I moved from Methesco, <laughs> excuse me, I moved from the Methodist Theological School uh, to Duke University, which was a pretty uh, dramatic move for me as I'm sure a culture shock. Uh, as the copyright and scholarly communication specialist in the libraries there, which I did for 10 years. Uh, so I have a lot of experience in copyright in higher education and not so much in the rest of the world. Um, but I also, I'm now the Dean of Libraries at the University of Kansas, uh, and you see one of the libraries behind me. Uh, and I also teach copyright law in the University of Kansas School of Law. So. That's the brief version of who I am. And I'll uh, pass the baton to another old friend, to Ann Gilliland. Hi, I'm Ann Gilliland. Um, I'm, my title is Scholarly Communications Officer for the UNC Chapel Hill Libraries, which tells the average person nothing at all about what I do. Uh, but a lot of what I do is, is indeed copyright. Um, I have have been at um, UNC nine years. Uh, and before that, uh, also doing copyright information and education at uh, Ohio State University. Um, I was also, uh, you know, we're part of this little niche cohort, uh, Coward and I, um, a, uh, a librarian who, and and I had worked for many, many years in working with virtual libraries and so on. Went to li li uh, law school in midlife. Kevin and I went to the same law school and I think we, we barely overlapped. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, then to my surprise and delight when I finished, actually even before I finished, I uh, got a job at Ohio State and started working with copyright. Um, I had gone to law school not thinking I would necessarily do copyright, um, although I, you know, very very happy to have been doing that. But that I, I just wanted a job where I got to do more writing, and so uh, I, I did get that. I've re this is really really fun work and. Uh, uh, more and more research libraries have people like me. Um, you know, they've hired these these folks for a variety of reasons. Uh, some of them involving fear, fears that they might be involved in litigation, uh, and just you know, with the 
uh, you know, sort of relentless progress of technology. They, they felt that they needed to really sort of up their capacity um, about copyright in their, the particular um, circumstance of, of libraries, uh, you know, especially large libraries doing a lot of digitization and things like that. And so my work is, um, uh, I have practiced law a little bit more than Kevin, but that's not, but that's not saying much. <laughs> I, I had a, a small private practice moonlighting with a friend of mine for a while in Ohio. Um, but uh, most of my work has been in this, this sort of education and inform informational kind of space. Um, most part of the work I do is for the libraries, about half of it. The other half is for the uh, university as a whole. And uh, I, uh, I really, it, it's a lot of fun. One of the things that I really enjoy working with are um, the special collections at UNC. Chapel Hill has a really robust um, set of, of special libraries that deal with um, the American South. And uh, those collections are particularly, uh, particularly sort of rewarding to work with. They go all the way from, uh, you know, the antebellum plantation uh, to, to documenting the civil rights movement to, to documenting the uh, demographic changes happening in the South right now. Um, all of that is, is super uh, important at, U at UNC and it, it is really a privilege to work with those collections. Um, one, of, one of those libraries includes what's called the Southern Folklife Collection, which is a, a very robust collection of um, video and audio about the South. So I am working a lot with sound recordings, particularly uh, in that, in that uh, genre. And again, it, uh, it's all over the place from wax cylinders to uh, recently created music and uh, has that uh, variety of, pro of problems and issues that, uh, that music in general has. Um, one of the reasons I told Kevin I was interested in doing this is that I have been involved also with a lot of different kinds of, of music, uh, both church music, and um, I'm also a shape note singer. So uh, I noticed Paul had uh, made mention of, a, of some litigation involving shape note hymns. Which, like you're talking to the right crowd. If you, if you want to talk shape note singing, the hymn society is, I know. <laughs> we love. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, UNC is one of the few places I've ever been where I say I'm a shape note singer and everybody goes, Oh, cool. Instead of their eyes glazing over, you know, so. right. Yeah. They can tell you where the nearest three sings are, you know, it's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. There, there are three things a month of the triangle, usually. Awesome. Um, and uh, and um, I think in general, I'm just interested in in creativity. You know how people make things, why they make them, and um, how they deal with the fights they get into about those creations. Which is then copyright is is involved in all three of those questions. Great. Thank you, Anne. And, and we're lucky to have Paul because Paul, until what, a day or two ago was, was off grid. And so, but it just, it just so happens he has internet uh, today and, and jumped on with us. So thanks for being here, Paul. Well, thanks for having me. I'm sorry to sort of bust into the meeting uh, so late, but uh, I got ahead on my cabin project and came back to Athens, Georgia for a week to hang out uh, and decompress a little bit. Um, I, so I taught copyright at the University of Georgia for 22 years, and I've taught it at the University of Illinois for the last 11 years. I think both Kevin and, and Anne will be interested that we just started a joint degree program with the School uh, for Information Science, the old library school at mm -hmm. Illinois, uh, because there's so much interest and need for librarians of all kinds to have, uh, you know, good, solid copyright education and, and vice versa, quite frankly. So we'll, that'll be up and running uh, next year. And Anne, I don't know if you overlap with Lolly Gassaway at all. Um, mm -hmm. 
you went to UNC, but and she was one of the first librarians to teach copyright law. Yes, yes, yeah, she's the, the grandmother of us all. Yeah, she, yeah, she, yeah she, I was going to say the same thing, also an inspiration for my decision to go to law school, so. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, as far as my own uh, uh, interests go, uh, I'm, I'm a congregational singer, my wife is a uh, former church choir director and just stepped down uh, as the leader of a large regional woman's chorus uh, in Illinois called uh, Amazon. And uh, she sung with various other groups too. And I, be, I really became interested in music copyright when, when I was singing for her and, and our local church and she handed us something, something by Brahms to sing and it said copyright 1982. I'm like, <laughs> I thought Brahms died uh, significantly. <laughs> that guy is prolific. Let me tell you, yeah, he just keeps amazing. going. <laughs> he's amazing. Um, well, and it, and that sort of led me to discover this fraudulent practice that a lot of uh, music publishers engage in of claiming copyright in in public domain works, and sort of got me interested in defending uh, the public domain from sort of each overreaching claims from uh, uh, from music publishers. But, um, and, and that sort of led me further into the really interesting question which uh, musicians constantly confront. And that is, if I see an arrangement of a public domain work, is it, is it really protected by copyright? Is it, is it new enough so that a new copyright has attached? Or, you know, uh, is, is this just a, a change of some dynamic markings uh, and, and, you know, a bit of tinkering that, that probably isn't, isn't protected? Uh, so that uh, was, you know, one primary area of interest, and that's how the shape note case comes up because this, the, this fabulous case involves whether the new alto lines added to the original sacred mm -hmm. hymnal created a new and protectable uh, work that couldn't be couldn't be uh, copied by by a competitor. And I teach that that case every single uh, every single year because it's so instructive about how original does something does a contribution have to be. To be protected. Um, more recently, uh, I've, I've gotten interested in, uh, and I'll, I'll shut up then, <laughs> but uh, of these recent and cases that have disturbed a lot of musicians uh, coming out of the Ninth Circuit, uh, where uh, seemingly just borrowing the vibe and feel and groove of a song somehow renders you liable for copyright infringement. And what I've become is sort of a defender of uh, existing norms among musicians. Um, I would like the law to match the way musicians actually borrow, actually behave the respect that they uh, give to uh, attribution uh, and uh, their own personal rules about what they think it's okay to take and, and, and what it isn't. And it's odd that in most areas of law, we defer to professional norms in engineering cases, medical malpractice cases, you name it. There's no separate tort law. You just ask the expert, is this the way a doctor normally behaves? If it is, it's not malpractice. Well, we should be asking in these music infringement cases, is this the way musicians normally behave? If it is, then it's not malpractice. It's not infringement to engage in the copying. Anyway, so uh, I've been thinking about those issues uh, also, but I'm really happy just to be a fly on the wall here and, and, and see what sort of uh, issues you all see percolating up out of the, the congregational uh, uh, singing uh, world. Oh, that's really interesting. I'm sorry, Brian. I was no, no, go ahead. Say that um, you know that issue of the norms that a community employs is really interesting, and I, I probably you're aware of the project that is, comes out of America, the Washington College of Law at American University, on best practices in fair use for different communities. Uh, the best practices in fair use for documentary filmmaking has been very impactful in that area. There is one for libraries, the, uh, and it's you know it's really a, a ripe opportunity. But it's founded on the idea that the norms of a community of practice should guide how the law is interpreted. Something you just articulated. Uh, the it is a real ripe opportunity there uh, in music, especially around church music because um, it has its own quirks as well. Yeah, yeah. Thanks thanks for that. I've known Peter Yazzie forever who's doing yeah. this, and I hadn't actually thought <laughs> to uh, connect oh, with, uh, with him there, and, and I'll, I'll do that as soon as this is over. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've been I have been thinking, as I was telling Brian before we started, I have 
uh, been watching a few of the other conversations and I have had been thinking best practices for fair use. This, you know, this is a good fit. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the main problem has been that there's there's virtually no case law uh, for fair use in music outside of parody. There's a lot of parody cases. There's literally, um, this, I know this because a guy at Vanderbilt just did a survey. There's literally two cases in 100 years uh, that applied the normal fair use doctrine to somebody who's borrowed, you know, a part of a melody or or, or an actual uh, piece of music as opposed to just par parodying the uh, uh, the lyrics. And I was at a conference in Nashville where I literally had a Nashville copyright lawyer pound his fist on a table saying, there is no fair use of music. Sure, films, what, but not music. It doesn't apply. And this, of course, is not in the statute. He's making this up. But that's the way the lawyers behave. And that's why we don't have any uh, intelligent discussion about it. Well, there's the case that's, I think, still in the Ninth Circuit about uh, Burbank High School. Yep. About yep, that's, the, that's um, one of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've been. That, that's been a, a final exam question for me for a couple of couple of years now. But that that's an interesting case because it does apply fair use to the creation of a medley, essentially, uh, the use of small portions of well-known sound recordings in a medley. Well, they're not sound. I'm sorry, I misspoke well-known compositions. We should talk about that distinction. Um, but it also involves some interesting questions about licensing uh, that is, of course, ubiquitous in the music business in general. So it's, a, it's an interesting case. I think it's just been referred for, is it for en banc hearing. So it's not, I thought it was over and I don't think it is. <laughs> to... Well, let, let, me, let me jump in. One of the questions I, I have written down is the, the second one. There's this, uh, in, in the church music, musician, you know, church realm, there's this kind of underlying fear that if we don't do the copyright thing correctly, that there are going to be some very severe consequences handed down at some point, or, or we could get in really big trouble uh, beyond the ethics of it. Um, and, and there's even, there are even some stories that I've heard, just anecdotes, I, I, I've not but but they're just stories that get passed around about churches in the 90s getting raided their church libraries were like raided and then if they had photocopied stuff you know then they got huge fines and um but but i'm wondering in in your experience are are there a lot of like copyright does that happen a lot or what what's the deal <laughs> what? you know we we use and i'm sure Anne, this is familiar to you as well we get the same kind of thing from librarians who, if I get copyright wrong, I'm going to lose my house and go to jail. And <laughs> so it's probably important to say, first of all, that in almost all cases, copyright law is a civil matter. That is, it's enforced. It's not the police. It's not the FBI, although some large content companies would like the FBI to be more involved. It is a matter <laughs> of a rights holder deciding to sue somebody uh -huh. for infringement. Um, so when, when you say, for example, a church was raided, my suspicion, and I don't know the story, is that one of the large licensing organizations that sell blanket licenses for performance um, quite possibly came by and said, we'd like to see your library and see if you're in compliance. Uh, I doubt that it was you know, the police with a search warrant breaking down the door. Right. That, that's a little bit of an exaggeration about what happened. Yeah. It's also true that the uh, the remedies, the penalties, if you will, in copyright law are very high. They're, it's a big number. But you get to the big number uh, through willful infringement. And actually, the chances of a church musician losing their house over copyright infringement are very, very slim. And fair use is always a defense, um, which helps a lot. It helps more in because if you respond correctly to the potent, the person who's threatening you, you can make things go away quite often. And um, so, you know, I think that that fear of uh, huge damages and, and uh, going to jail and such should be moderated quite a bit. <laughs> okay. That's good to know. 
I just leaned yeah. over and asked Jill, and she's heard the same stories, but has no direct knowledge of anybody yeah. in her cohort that's ever had a personal uh, experience like this. And I was on the, the I was copyright faculty at the Swanee Church Music Conference a couple of years ago. Oh, yeah. Literally go there, or literally religiously go there, and uh, no, uh, uh, you know, nobody ever had a direct story either. Certainly, the criminal thing, I can actually say something about that, right? There's no state jurisdiction, so it wouldn't be the police showing up. It would have to be the FBI because mm, it's only right. the, only the feds that have jurisdiction enforce the criminal law. And I have talked to federal prosecutors and asked them, at what level uh, of copying do you? Are you willing to spend resources away from catching drug kingpins and right. focus on, on copyists? And they're like, well, it's got to be a question. Yeah, it's got to be at least in Chicago. Is that if it's if if it's less than ten thousand copies, we got better things to do. <laughs> right. So okay. it, yeah. it, it's really got to be a genuine piracy operation, not unintentional right. copying of too many. Right, like like somebody setting up a publishing company where they're like taking stuff that's copyrighted and then like reselling it and distributing. <laughs> no. yeah, f- fencing, fencing him scores. Um, so one of the hey, things my. that occurs to me is so that a- anyone out there who's thinking about doing this now, this is your warning. All right, sorry, <laughs> Anne, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, one thing that occurs to me that might have been what happened. Um, I know some. Right, uh, rights organization that ma- that manage rights um, in various contexts, you know, and sell a blanket license for, for rights management. Um, I don't know particularly about the ones that the um, that 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 the church communities tend to use, but certainly some of those organizations build into their contracts something that says we have the right to come in and look at, at your records. And that could happen, and that might have been, you know, sort of the genesis of these stories. Um, so I guess my my uh, takeaway for people is, as always, read your contract, even though it's boring. Read it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> read the small print. Yeah, um, that is great advice. <laughs> I want to I want to back up. Um, I think one of the things that a lot of people just don't know. Um, outside of folks like yourselves is, is kind of the, the basic history of why why copyright is a thing, like how, how it came about and like what was the purpose of it and um, and, and how we've kind of gotten to today in, in the world of church music and, and copyright because there is certainly a history. And I think one of the questions that, that comes up a lot in, in my uh, uh, sphere um, is not only the legalities but the moralities, and and I think the history of something is is very much intertwined when we start talking about what's moral and what's legal and how do those interplay and why did this thing exist in the first place? Because I think a lot of law is designed to kind of play into that conversation, right? It's bad to kill people, so we should make a law where you, sh- you can't kill people. <laughs> You know, uh, or, you know, it's bad to steal people's work, so we should have copyrights. Could could one of you maybe give a flyby history of music copyright? I'd, I'd so. be happy to, to do that. Um, most, But, you know, you'll see the sort of spin that, that, I, that I put on it and, and can make your own, your own conclusions. But modern copyright law, right, starts with the statute of Anne in 1712, I think it is. Which, and the idea there wasn't, oh, we love authors, we need to stimulate creativity and give them a brand new right. It was, we need to take power away from the stationer's company who had a complete monopoly over all publishing in England. So it was, a, it was a transfer of power from this small clique of publishers in the UK. Uh, and that monopoly gets broken up by transferring the initial right to, to authors themselves who hadn't had that right, hadn't had that right before. Um, and of course, the, the initial term of protection was much shorter. It was uh, 14 years, which is then borrowed by the framers of the, the Constitution and the first uh, copyright uh, statute. So, you know, the notion was you don't need a whole lot of, of protection in order to, to give authors 
uh, their due. And subsequent amendments to the Copyright Act have almost entirely been driven by publishers and, and not by authors. They'll trot out an author or an author's heir to do some testimony, but um, it's, it's been driven by the middlemen, uh, uh, really. And, and for me, to such an extent, I mean, I've written extensively about the length of the copyright term and the damage that it does to, to creativity and the damage that it does to accessibility to works has gotten to, to the point where, you know, the, the, for me, it, the, the copyright law itself is so overprotective as to be, as to be immoral. You know, it, it's my sense that life of the author plus 70 years, locking up all of those resources and preventing future artists from exploiting um, those works, uh, you know, like I said, not only actually results in accountable diminishment of the number of works that are available for to us for purchase, but also handcuffs, you know, what you can do and what you can build on over time as a creative person uh, yourself. So for me, if you're complying with copyright law, then, <laughs> then, then you've by far and in a way met any sort of ethical obligations that, 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 that you might have. I can't imagine a situation where, um, you know, you might be complying with copyright law and, and I would consider it to be yet nonetheless to be an uh, unethical act, except in the context of attribution, right? You, you, it's not a violation of copyright to take a public domain work and copy it. If you claim it as your own when it isn't, that seems to me immoral and unethical, but not a violation of, of copyright. But except for that, that, that context, um, I, don't, I don't see that debate as being super robust until copyright law gets watered down to a point where we might say, hey, copyright isn't doing enough. We need personally to take it upon our own shoulders to behave in such a way uh, that we think will foster future creativity. But I think those days have long passed. But like I said, that's, uh, that, you can see that's kind of a polemical response. And I'm sure Ann and, and Kevin have a different spin. Well, I think it's interesting, Paul, that you talk about um, copyright having reached a point of being in some sense immoral. And I, because I was going to talk about the situation where copyright could become unconstitutional. And- um, Let's you know, do Paul, it. <laughs> Paul, Paul uh, is, has, you know, of course, uh, indicated the, uh, the origins in British law uh, and the fact that, the UK, that um, America copied UK law around copyright as it did so many other things uh, is significant. Uh, copyright was adopted. First, the Constitution gives Congress the right to adopt copyright and patent laws. The Congress only has power that you know, they're given by the Constitution. And there's a specific clause that says that in order to promote the so progress of science and the useful arts, Congress can pass copyright laws. That's not the language. I can't quote the whole thing. But um, it was for the first copyright law was adopted in the United States in 1790, a year after the Constitution was adopted. Uh, I just have a couple dates that I'll give you. Music was first protected in 1831, and sound recordings weren't protected until 1972. Uh, so that, that's a really interesting, and it, it, it gets us towards some key issues. It's always the case that your phone rings when you're on a... Uh, uh, on a panel like this. Uh, the, the other things that I wanted to say, because copyright comes from the British tradition, there are several things about it. One, it's primarily utilitarian. Other countries have focused more on so-called moral rights. The United States has not. Copyright is a creature of statute. It's a right granted by the, the positive law. Um, as Paul says, it's extended a long way and the question would be, is there a point where the extension of copyright, either in terms of what it protects or how long it protects it, might cause the law itself to no longer serve that constitutional purpose to promote the progress of science and the useful art? I think Paul is suggesting that we may already have reached that point. The Supreme Court has heard two challenges like that that have said copyright has extended so far that it no longer meets its constitutional purpose and therefore you Supreme Court should strike down these extensions as unconstitutional. So far the Supreme Court has declined that invitation. And just full um, disclosure, my wife was a plaintiff in Elder versus- Oh, okay. You know, <laughs> and I helped Larry Lessig with the, with the, the, the briefs along, along the way. So uh, 
I like the argument, but <laughs> yeah, it, no, it's a good, it's a good argument. It's just not the one the Supreme Court bought. Yeah, um, I'm going to go back, Brian, to your um, original question about sort of the origins and and just sure. um, highlight a couple of things that I think are significant in, in talking about how copyright even came to be. And one of them is the um, sort of the milieu in, in uh, 1709 and, and in the decades before that. Uh, you know, this was a time when there was, had been a lot of um, uh, restlessness about government censorship. Uh, there had been, uh, you know, John Milton had written a famous uh, essay about uh, calling, calling for, for, for freedom of the press. Uh, John Locke was, was quite irritated at one point about the fact that um, the stationers had tied up things like uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey <laughs> for all time, practically, basically, uh, despite the fact that these were extremely ancient texts. How come they're the only people who can print them and, and who can control them? And um, it was also coming out of a period during the, um, the uh, uh, English civil wars in the, in the 1600s when there was a blossoming of presses that were illegal, uh, that, that promoted all kinds of ideas, uh, many of them you know, things that the government and, and in some cases the church would not, of course, the question there was which church uh, would not countenance. And so it, it all came out of this idea that uh, we, we've got to fix this. And uh, it didn't fix it, didn't fix everything, but it was out of a time when there was an idea that uh, we, need, we need more autonomy in certain ways. And uh, that isn't always evident when we talk about copyright law today. Hmm. Thank you, Anne. Um, so we have been joined by, by Peter uh, Midgley. Uh, so would you introduce yourself and, and welcome to the conversation. Thanks for being here. Uh, thanks, Brian. I'm sorry that I'm late, everyone. Um, my name is Peter Midgley. I'm the director of the Copyright Licensing Office at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. So we're a faith-based institution and bump into copyright issues around um, church music often. <laughs> and it's, um, well, anyway, it's, it's a fun little area to navigate and I'm thrilled to be part of it. And then sorry, I was late. Well, I, I want to, I want to ask, uh, maybe, maybe this is too specific, but it, but maybe not, maybe it's, it's good conversation. And I think it, it, it relates to some things we've already hit on. <clears throat> Let's say, uh, there's a, a, a recording of a spirit of a, a, a Negro spiritual, right? African-American spiritual, which is obviously public domain. And we don't know who wrote it because mostly the, the origins of a song like that would have been communal. So not there, no, you're not a single author or composer necessarily. And uh, someone in 2019 made a recording of it with some new chords underneath it and publishes it copyright right so they say it's a it's a traditional song this arrangement is copyrighted the melody is intact the words are intact from the public domain thing but the arrangement the chords and stuff are unique and then my church live streams us performing that song in corporate worship That feels weird to me. And most of my colleagues, I think, it feels odd to have something like that copyrighted. And then the question is, where's the money going? Because, <laughs> right? Because who's getting paid to put those chords on there? Um, and if I change three of the chords in, during my live performance compared to the piece that I'm looking at, you know, just because of mistakes or improvisations, does that then make it mine? Um I think that that maybe Paul, you you were talking earlier, and someone commented on our YouTube feed about the publisher's fraudulent claims on PD Music, and this I think this has been highlighted during the pandemic because when we upload things to you, when we live stream to YouTube, 
like we're doing now, or, you know, I, I just did this. I'm, I'm uploading videos for our conference coming up next month, and I'm getting tons of copyright claims on like the melody of a shape note tune or the lyrics to a Fanny Crosby song or, you know, just stuff that is obviously in the public domain. Um, and I keep having to dispute these things, you know, no, Sony, you don't, you don't own, um, this German chorale from the reformation. <laughs> Sorry. Yep. Uh, so what could you chew on that for a while as a group? I'd, I think people would love to hear you, your opinions on this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I have two things. First, um, uh, my colleague, Jason Mazzoni wrote a book called uh, copy fraud, where he collects all of these kind of stories that you were, you were just telling. I, I in fact, had when in the old days when you just copy shops to copy drafts of articles before you sent them off to, to publishers, I had a copy shop tell me that, uh, uh, they wouldn't copy my article because the, uh, the U.S. Constitution in my appendix, and it said copyright Macmillan 1956. And they said, well, we can't, we can't violate copyright law by, by copying the U.S. Constitution. Um, so, so, I mean, it's, it's a real problem, and overreach is a real problem. Uh, yeah. Now, in your particular hypo is really interesting um, as to whether that would be an over reach. I mean, there, there's really only one or two cases in the 20th century that protect harmony alone, as opposed mm -hmm. to, uh, and that was the most famous one, the Duke Ellington case of the, the harmony for satin doll, which is super, you know, it's, it's not generated by conventional rules of harmony. So we'd want to know a little bit more about these underlying chords. If they're pretty conventional, then th there's probably not an, an original arrangement that'd be protected. But it'd be possible to imagine a funky enough set of chord progressions or non-progressions and expected twists and turns where, uh, mm -hmm. where, where you might actually, you know, be violating some of these copyright by, by copying, uh, by copying those. But I always do this defer to musicians there. I mean, really, in a court of law, what's going to happen is there's going to be two musicologists debating how original something is. It's not a mm -hmm. question really for lawyers. It's a question for, for musicians. Well, and this came up, right? Um, the, was it, oh, it, it was in pop music. It wasn't church music. There was some case um, where a, a musicologist was, this was maybe three years ago, he had to testify on how unique a chord, or how similar a chord progression was between two things. Was it Katy Perry? No. Or, it was the Katy Perry case. Yeah. yeah. And I was looking at these chords, and I was thinking, man, these are just like, <laughs> Like these are chords you teach like a middle schooler taking piano lessons to like harmonize a song, yeah. you know, like they're not, <laughs> they're not Duke Ellington, yeah. like yeah. groundbreaking chord progressions. And that is so often the situation, as Paul said, you have two experts testifying on the similarity. And this is where there is a lot of litigation around music. It is this question of the, the legal standard, believe it or not, is substantial similarity. Um, and so that's what they're arguing about in the Katy Perry case. Uh, Blurred Lines was very famous. Uh, recent case, there's a Stairway to Heaven case that's, uh, well, mostly worked its way through the courts. Um, and yeah, that's exactly what you're looking at is whether or not there is substantial similarity. I did want to just step back and say the copyright law identifies actually six exclusive rights that a rights holder has. One of those is the right to control derivative works. And so when that arrangement is made, first of all, there assume, let's, let's say that it's a copyrighted song, not something that's in the public domain. First sure. of all, they're going to need to have a license from the composer of the original to make that derivative work. Yep. And that may be obtained through one of the rights organizations, ASCAP, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, Mechanical licenses, I think, are what they're typically called in. Or um, Yeah, okay. Um, once the arrangement is made, it may be a derivative work if it's added enough new material. Uh -huh. and in that case, the arranger will get a copyright in the new material, not in the original material. So when I, I was thinking about your hypo, that new arrangement may have a copyright if there's sufficiently new original creative material. Creative is a dangerous word there. Um, but uh, it's a very minimal standard of creativity. Yeah. Uh, 
so the answer in that case might be, yeah, you may need permission from the, the rights holder in the arrangement if it is sufficiently changed. Uh, but there's no way that that arranger can claim any rights in the original song. Now, it, it strikes me that one of the reasons why we may not have any cases about this, whereas we do have a couple of cases like with giant pop stars and stuff is, you know, follow the money, right? right. Who's going to have the time and the money to challenge this in the courts? Like no one, like this is ridiculous. Um, it would take a church musician or an individual church, like challenging a publisher and saying like, you shouldn't have copyright over this. I'm going to do what I want. And then the publisher would have to say, we're bringing you to court, which is going to cost them a ton of money, way more than the thirty dollars that they're missing out on, or whatever. You know, <laughs> so is is this is is that the reason why we don't have why the system has kind of continued to just be nebulous? And does that mean that it's just going to continue that way because no one's challenging it in the courts? I, I think Paul answered that question earlier by saying that church musicians tend to behave in a very ethical way. Um, but anyway, I, I think you were going to say something and I just wanted to get that in. I, I was just going to say the exact same thing. I, 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 again, I'm sorry I was late, but I would, I would say that, you, you know, our experience is that, um, you know, I mean, it is literally, uh, our particular faith has as one of its articles of faith that we believe in following the law. I mean, that's, it's, it's that central and core to who we are as a religious organization. And so, um, you know, we don't look for clever workarounds. Generally, we're not trying to go right up to the edge and say, well, what can we get away with? You know, if, if, if we don't think it's proper to do, but no one's going to catch us, we don't do it. Uh, generally, uh, you know, as religious performers, I would say, because, you know, we're, we're a group that a community of performers that are uh, guided by a set of morals and ethics uh, that prevent that kind of um, activity. So, I would, I would just say, uh, kind of re returning to what Kevin was just talking about, um, when, you're, when you are trying to go out and seek an adaptation uh, license uh, for a derivative uh, work, this, this exclusive right that was being referenced, um, there, are, there are practical problems too. <laughs> what, what, so Tresona is one of the, the big organizations that is involved in that space. And you know many music publishers have, have basically delegated this function to that particular company. And when you go and to them, as we do often, to try to get an arranging license, um, what they need is a copy of the sheet music. Well, one of our performing groups here at BYU is an a cappella group, and they don't, they, it, it, a cappella musicians are just, there, there is no sheet music. <laughs> I mean, literally, the, the musicians, they record, um, you know, um, orally. Yeah. The music, and that's how it's transmitted out to the performers, and that's yeah, how it's an oral tradition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so you don't have, so we go to the website, we we call up the phone number and say we'd like to get an uh, an arranging license, and the people say, well, send us your sheet music, and we say we don't have any, and and they say I don't, there's no form on our little, uh, no box on our little form to check for you, and, and so, there, you know, you you run into these interesting logistical. Uh, challenges with certain types of, of music, even if even if you are sitting there trying to go in through the front door, so to speak, um, y there are a lot of people who are involved in this industry who are not lawyers. They they they're not trained in the nuances of copyright law. They have forms that they need to fill out and check boxes that they need to check. And if you don't neatly fit into one of those forms, and some of our uses in in the church music space don't neatly fit into the forms, and so it can be challenging that way. Well, I, I want to dig into that a little bit, but Anne, I think you were trying to jump in as well. So yeah. go ahead. Um, well, I was going to sort of bring up a maybe a little bit more of a a darker reason why we don't have case law, which which is that it's it's really expensive for um, most the ordinary person to defend. Um, and certainly also to, to bring a lawsuit. So I think there's a powerful, powerful drive to settle. Uh, maybe you got involved in something where you, you think, you know, you think you're right. You, you're, you know, maybe your attorney thinks you're right, but um, litigating it's gonna, gonna cost a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And um, 
uh, that that I think is a is a barrier for people a lot of times. Uh, you know, just just pay the fine and go on is 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 something that uh, looks very enticing and might be the smartest thing to do from a financial point of view. Mm-hmm. Um, there is a a uh, the copyright office is in the midst of set setting up a sort of a small claims court for copyright. It's got other problems, many other problems. Um, <laughs> it doesn't look to me like it's going to solve uh, the, the problem I just talked mm. about. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's really, as, and, and Peter, actually Peter's example is a good ex- example of this too, where the uh there's a system you know that it's built to work for the majority and people who sort of are outside that box um as in many bureaucracies uh have a really hard time navigating it i'll I'll be even darker than Anne and and suggest that when uh, music publishers lose cases at trial they don't they don't appeal because they do not want Mm -hmm. Precedent set. So things that happen at trial are not precedential and they don't create law. So they avoid appeals uh, that they think they're going to lose, leave the world nebulous because musicians are risk averse. If the world is nebulous, then they're going to toe the line way below um, the uh, legal. Yeah, and the case might not even be reported in any way. Right, probably, right. Probably isn't. So uh, you'd have to sort of know about it to find it oh wow if, if there's here's a here's a fun example of what Anne was just talking about that i think i just have to share i'm sorry um there's an exemption um for in the law for um musical works that are performed in the course of services at a place of worship or religious assembly yep and that's a that's an exemption that has rarely if ever been litigated substantively <laughs> so mike huckabee's presidential campaign was sued uh a few years back when he um he held a rally for a particular um, um, county clerk who was refusing to issue gay marriage licenses. When <sighs> and and after she was on the courthouse steps, they held a rally for her and played "Eye of the Tiger." Survivor actually sued the Huckabee campaign for this, and one of their defenses was this was a religious assembly on the courthouse steps, and there were lots of people there with Bibles and crosses and things. and And this was a case that we were quite interested in at BYU. We wanted to see a court finally tell us what exactly is a religious assembly yes. and how yes. how formal does it need to be. And unfortunately for us, the case settled uh, before <laughs> we had a court get, get to weigh in on that very fascinating legal question. Um, so anyway, that, that's just an example of the kind of thing that Anne is talking about, that um, even when you do get these occasional fascinating questions, it's it's so expensive to litigate that it's, it's often just finds its way to, to get resolved without us actually getting the questions answered. Well, and, and I think that, that issue right there is has been just completely the 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 expo it's been completely just blown up and exposed because of our ability now to stream wide wide, widespread streaming right it's so easy now for any church to worship and stream it live and then that automatically gets archived so is the archive I, i that's a huge question for people is is how you know how long are these going to be up do we have to keep paying royalties on this archived live stream? Um, I don't think anyone's answered that. Um, other than I do know that technically we're supposed to renew our license and report once we've reached a threshold of viewers, you have to re-report it and get a new license. So this could, I just don't see the end of it. Well, a, a, a big question I think that comes along th- there, a, a related question is, what's the responsibility of the platform on which you're doing the streaming? So, you know, YouTube or Facebook or wherever it is that you're doing those mm-hmm. streaming, um, you know, there, there are very, very robust uh, notice and takedown procedures that are in place. There are also a set of, of secret agreements between music publishers and these platforms which have authorized so so YouTube has a whole set of agreements in place with every major music publisher, yep. which permits the performance of music on YouTube. But but 
we as religious organizations are not parties to those agreements between the publishers and YouTube. It's not clear what, to what extent we could be third party beneficiaries of those agreements and and how our use of music on YouTube um, might expose us separately to liability <laughs> or can we somehow take advantage of the fact that th those um, that there's a license in place between the publisher and YouTube. Um, those are as far as I'm aware, unanswered questions. Well, and th that as a church musician or as a pastor, especially I've talked to a lot of solo pastors, you know, they've got like 50 people in their church. They're the only staff member. They know nothing about music or copyright law. And they spend hours every week trying to make sure that they've procured, procured, procured the right license, that they're putting it in the right places and all these things. And then they still get tagged on YouTube and then they have to dispute it and they have to say, we have a license because there's no mechanism to tell them ahead of time, I have a license to do this. Like there's no way on this live stream, if I was to use a song to open up, even if I had a streaming license to do it, there's no way for me to tell YouTube I'm allowed to do this. I've paid my money. And so it could just shut it down. And it's like, that feels like a violation of our, especially in the context of worship, it feels like a First Amendment violation mm -hmm. to have our worship shut down when we have a life, we've done everything right, and then it just cuts off. You know, I, I don't know, it's just, it's tough. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, oh, sorry, Kevin. I was just going to say, YouTube shutting off your service is not a legal that's not a rights holder filing a, a complaint against you. <laughs> so that it's it's just a private agreement between you and YouTube. Uh, but it certainly has the effect uh, in practical terms of, of making it feel like YouTube is essentially acting as the judge, jury and executioner, um, even though it's just, you know, no formal legal proceeding has even taken place in the in the situation you just described. Huh. And I was just going to make very much the same point that Peter did, except to add that as a private corporation, and I think this is rather poorly understood in our society, the First Amendment doesn't actually apply. Oh. The First Amendment is about things that the government does, and it's to restrain the government. So um, YouTube taking down your worship or interrupting it uh, because they think you violated copyright, mm -hmm. they're probably wrong, given the way church musicians tend to behave, they're probably wrong on the copyright issue. Uh, they're not violating the First Amendment because they're not bound by it. So we're just stuck with that reality. And if we want to circumvent it, we could just set up our own streaming service. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you do. If, I mean, YouTube does have decent internal administrative mechanisms. If you are taken down, they have to inform you, and then you have you get the chance to explain you have the license and stuff. It's a pain in right. the butt. Not, and it takes time. Yeah. Right. Sure. And that's the question is like, how how far it, it becomes like a cost benefit for people in ministry? How much time do I need to spend being compliant, and or should I just forget about it and do something else that's a better use of my time? Yeah, it's a really it's a frustrating situation. We go to um, those of us who are involved in the space. You know, the United States Copyright Office will host roundtables where they will they bring rights holders together with users, and the rights holder community generally is there saying. You know, rampant piracy on YouTube is killing us. We're our industry is dying, and it's you know that's kind of their uh, refrain. And meanwhile, you know, I, we have no um, <laughs> no quarrel with that, right? Like none of us are out here trying to be pirates. We we would love if there were some reliable mechanism that we could use in the vast majority of cases, and we could pay a reasonable price. Um, we would love to do so. It is just such a confusing um, labyrinth. Uh, of agreements and and I, you know those of us who are sitting here trying to go in through the front door mm -hmm. are often frustrated by how difficult it is you know the fact that you're talking about pastors who are trying to go get the licenses they need and it's not even clear which license you need and to whom it needs to get paid and it's a very very frustrating situation um and and unfortunately uh, at least the conversations that I've been a part, it, it seems like we're pass talking past each other <laughs> where, you, you know, the, the big elephant in the room are all these folks who are trying to do piracy. And we can all agree that that's not good. Right. But it doesn't address the other problem of what about those of us who aren't trying to be pirates? How do you know, how do we go, uh, so, do it correctly? I, I, I want to respect everyone's time. And we're about five minutes till the hour. 
Um, and, and, and this is just the beginning of these conversations. Um, for those of you who've been watching um, and don't know, we're, we're trying to host these initial conversations from very specific vantage points. So we've, we've had church musicians and pastors. We've had, um, oh, 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 artists themselves who write music. This one was uh, from the kind of intellectual property law lens. And then in the fall, um, I'm, I'm going on paternity leave at any moment. Um, I'm grateful that I'm here. That means the baby hasn't arrived. Um, in, in the fall, on in September 8th at 3 p.m., we're going to have uh, publishers, um, and we're going to talk about it from their perspective. And then uh, through the help of, of uh, a partner organization, we're going to have uh, all of these constituents together, and we're going to work together to see what can be done. What, what are the ways forward um, to make this work better? So the question that I've ended with, with every group, is if you, if you had a, a magic wand that you could wave and change one thing to make the system work better from your perspective, what would be that one thing? And, and let's, um, let's start with Peter, since you were the, you kind of just alluded to the thing you would change, but I'll give you a chance again. And then uh, Paul and then Anne and Kevin, because that's the reverse of how we introduced ourselves at the beginning. <laughs> Yeah, I think um, if I can add, I'll take advantage of the opportunity to add one more thing, <laughs> uh, because I did say uh, I, I do think what's desperately needed is um, clarity and sim- and a more simplified process for those of us who are tr- trying to to, you know, like I right. say, go, go in through the front door. Um, but having said all that, um, if, if I were to make one change to the law, I think the term is too long. I, I think it's just far, far the, too long. The life plus... So yeah, years. seventy years, yeah. Um, and um, so there, that's the change I would make. Paul, right. So uh, I agree totally on the copyright term length. I'd make a technical change, uh, which would help musicians a lot, and that is pre nineteen seventy six copyright records are not online. You can't search them <laughs> online. You cannot find out if somebody renewed their copyright in a nineteen thirty eight song. You can't find out who owns it. Their the records are are not digitized. So, you know, I would put everything online and make it searchable so that we know what's in the public domain and what is not. Mm. Then penalize owners who uh, have taken uh, rights by assignment and don't record those assignments. You should lose your, your, your copyright if you don't tell the copyright office you're the new owner so that people can find you and ask for a freaking, freaking license. Yeah. <laughs> and? Well, I, I like what everybody else has said, but um, my, my, my big wish is, is a process wish, which is that there were better ways to build in um, input from, from different communities uh, other than rights, rights holder organizations. Uh, when copyright law is being discussed nationally, uh, when the, you know when we they have these roundtables, notices of inquiry, and so on, if there was in some way a be- a way to make a bigger section of the people who maybe don't have a lot of money on the table, but who do have a lot of interests on the table. Uh, so that they their voices could be heard more regularly. Thank you, Anne. And Kevin. Well, um, I agree with everything that's been said, and especially about the term. So I'm going to give you a slightly geeky answer that requires just a little bit of history. That's why we're here. When the United <laughs> States adopted its new Copyright Act, new, in 1976, it was anticipa- in anticipation of joining an international agreement called the Berne Convention. Yes. The Berne Convention requires two things. No formalities. You can't have to register your copyright or renew it or anything like that. And a minimum term of protection of life plus 50. Those are required to join this international convention. Hmm. They don't actually dictate what your local law has to be, but they do dictate how you have to treat people from other countries. So my geeky wish that really gets back to what all of these folks have been saying is that we put back some kind of registration or renewal requirement 
inside that term so that after 20 years, you had to say to the copyright office, I still care about enforcing my copyright or I don't care anymore. We could do that, but only for US rights holders. We couldn't do it for the rest of the world because of the strictures of this international convention, which is probably a subject for another phone call. <laughs> Fantastic. This this has been, I, I have very much enjoyed myself and I just find myself um, grateful that you've all agreed to be here and I'm looking forward to what happens over the next year. Um, and I'm, I'm just thankful for all of the work you do uh, in each of your libraries and places of influence. Um, keep fighting the good fight. And if you've joined us from out there in YouTube world, uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, make sure to register for the Hymn Society Conference coming up next month. And I will look forward to the next copyright chat, which once again will be September 8th at 3 p.m. here on YouTube Live. Thanks, everybody.